Without further ado, let's start. So welcome to uh, what turns out to be the late spring lecture, I guess. That's number one. I want to thank the rabbi and all the members of the board for agreeing. Uh, and this, I want to thank the tech team, as you see now, <laughs> worked out very efficiently to make this go on time. And when Bill Sachs is home territory, he knows this better than anyone. <laughs> And, and uh, I just want to take a word how the, what the genesis of this is because back on Pesach, I got a call from Chav um, Roosevelt, Robert Herzberg's daughter, and said, you know, the yard site's coming up right after Pesach. And I immediately thought to myself, what can we do a talk on? And this popped in my head. Well, you know, the, the show where I'm at is originally a Galciana operation. Now, by Hertz, with a galaxy honor. We'll see what that means. And I said, well, you know, I never did anything on that. And so let me speak about that. It was a tribute to uh, the art side. Once I started writing it up, I realized, what are you, crazy? It's like writing about World War II in one, <coughs> in one speech. Uh, it, just, it just hit me. I never gave a thought to it. It's a huge subject. And I said to myself, well, we're going to do this right. And uh, it's turned into the current series. And so, uh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, we're going to be talking this series, I hope, about the Jews of Galicia, uh, which is an episode. It came and went. There aren't any Galicianists left in Galicia. I think everybody who follows the news today knows it's a war zone. You understand? And the Jews. I wouldn't say got the heck out of there, they were killed in Hitler's time, overwhelmingly. So I'm talking about, it's an episode, but it's very uh, applicable to us today because there are many people here, I'm sure people in the audience, whose ancestors are from Galicia. Uh, some people don't even realize it because I had a talk the other day with someone who ended up sponsoring one of these talks and he said, well, this isn't interesting to me because my mother's, my parents are from that. So where's your father from? From this and this place. And where's your mother from? From Lemberg. I said, Lemberg was the capital city of Galicia. You understand? So uh, there are plenty of Jews in the USA and elsewhere who are descendants from the hundreds of thousands of Jews that emigrated from there and went elsewhere prior to World War I and prior to World War II. The main immigration was before World War I, before we had all those quotas. Uh, and so hundreds of thousands of Jews, it's really, the numbers are quite remarkable considering you're talking about just one province, uh, emigrated out of there, we'll see why, in the 1800s, early 1900s, okay? Uh, they were the lucky ones, correct? Because everybody else fell in the hands of Hitler and Stalin, which is not what you want to, where you want to be. And so, Galicia, as with other diaspora communities, was an episode. It no longer exists. It was part of the Austrian Empire, which no longer exists. More on that in a minute. The unique character of Galicia and the Galician Jews was a function of the fact that they were ruled by the Austrians. And that lasted from 1772 to 1918, so it's a little bit less than 150 years. So for 150 years, this particular group of Jews, which was in the hundreds of thousands, and to be perfectly honest, comes out to a million and a half, if you encounter everybody who immigrated from there, was under a very unique and special kind of circumstances different than the other Jews, as we shall see. There is, that's why, as you can see over here, there was something once upon a time called the Austrian Empire, which doesn't mean it's ruled by the Austrian people. The Austrian Empire means the Habsburg Empire. The name, the official name of the royal family, the Habsburg, the official name was the House of Austria, Haus Österreich. So they called the Austrian Empire, I mean, the, the, the empire that was ruled by the dynasty of Austria. That's what it means. So here, this whole business is the Austrian Empire. Uh, that's, it had different parts to it. Like, for example, Hungary was a separate piece. This is Galicia, OK? This is Galicia. Uh, as you can see, all of Poland, pretty soon I'll show you, was uh, divided up between three countries. This is the part that Austria got. This is the part that Russia got. This is the part that Germany or Prussia got, and so forth. And again, you see over here that the Galicia part is up against the Russian Empire. This is right there. So 
if you were Jewish and lived here, especially in the 1800s, you were luckier than if you lived there because it was harder under the Russians. We won the piece of cake under the Ossets, but it was harder under the Russians, as we shall see. There is a postscript to this, and I put it in the series, of what I would call the last 20 years, 1919 to 1939, after the First World War when the Austrian Empire collapsed and was replaced by the Republic of Poland. And that has a different character. So we don't exactly call that the story of Galicia, but it's a postscript. That would be when the map you just saw was replaced by the new Poland that Woodrow Wilson set up. And then the area of Galicia would then simply be part of the old Polish uh, a kingdom, Polish Republic, in which, as we shall see, the situation of the Jews deteriorated. So you're usually used to thinking that as time goes forward, things get better. Although I don't think <laughs> we think like that anymore. When I was young, I used to think every day and every way the world's getting better and better. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. Even though dramatic things did happen there during the interwar period, and I'm talking about Jewishly. For example, I don't know how many people are aware, the Beis Yaakov movement started in Galicia. It's a Galician phenomenon. That's why Rabbi Hertzberg, who started my show, is the first person who, start, who, who uh, pushed for a Beis Yaakov in Baltimore. This is from the original journal from 1948-49. And here you have the guys that uh, got the charter for what eventually became the Beis Yaakov School a year or two later. And this Rabbi Hertzberg. And these are all, mostly guys from his show, not all, a bunch of Galicianers. So most people wouldn't say, oh, the uh, Beis Yaakov movement, which became such a big deal, is, has, is, a, is a Galicianer phenomenon, but it was. Sarashnir, for example, lived in Krakow, which is one of the two big cities in Galicia. But it's a postscript. The formation of what we call the Galicianers as a type, both from and not from, that's a function of the 150 years when they're ruled by the Austrians from 1772 to 1918. And obviously, we all know, the Shoah killed everybody. And that's what happened there. Between the Germans and the Ukrainians and this, that, and the other, that's what happened. But uh, let's start at the beginning. So how did Aust So in other words, what I intend to do with you is take you through, in this series, there's going to be six parts, taking you through the 150 years, basically. I'm going to spend day today giving the background, but you, you're not interested in 500 years or any kind of stuff. It's rather a small amount of time. But it's a very interesting amount of time. This is called the beginning of the modern era in which you and I live, in which all these changes kicked into Jewish life as we know. And the question is going to be how does it apply in this particular province, which was one of the most populous Jewish provinces anywhere. Uh, so let's start at the beginning. How did Austria, which is over there, end up ruling a part of Poland, which is elsewhere? I mean, how'd that happen? In order to answer this question, we have to know some of the relevant history of these two kingdoms or empires. I'm talking about the Polish kingdom, and, or if you prefer, the Polish empire, and the Austrian empire, okay? Now, for our purposes, we can start with the history of Poland in the 1500s, but we will not spend a long time there. At that time, in the 1500s, two things happened, as you can see on this map. What you see over here is, a, is how the two countries united into one big country. It's a big if you're in both. The one on the right, the yellow part, that's Lithuania. The smaller part is Poland. The two of them came together to, to, to create what was called the United Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania. They did so for the simplest reasons. They're scared of Russia. <laughs> that's Russia. So Putin was around at that time also. OK, they said, we got to uh, hug together. And they created what was called the Polish the, uh, the Nobles Republic of um, Poland and Lithuania. Uh, and number two, the nobles got, gained all the power. Not the people, the Polish nobility. They grabbed all the power. So for the next two centuries, from 1569 to 1769, the nobles, the Polish nobles, Potocki, Czartoryski, this one, this one, that one, you know, Poniatowski, all those names, they reduced the population in the countryside to slavery. I want this to be clear. They're very tough and cruel. And if you were Polish peasant, you lived a drudge life. I mean, you, you basically, it's not exactly like being a slave in the Negro plantations of Mississippi before the Civil War, but it wasn't that far different. It's not the same, but it was very tough. Okay? Now, uh, the nobles worked at a system 
for doing this. And it was in this system that the Jews who were immigrating to the country at that time were assigned a key role. That's the plain truth of it. So the Jews moved to Poland exactly this time that this development happened. You see, at the same time the, Pol the nobles were gaining this power, at the same time the Lithuanians and the Poles were uniting to create such a big empire, there occurred a very large Ashkenazic immigration into Poland. The Jews were running away from Germany into Poland, augmenting the Jews who were already there. And eventually, what they called the Jesuit Polita, the Nobles Republic, became the largest Jewish community as we know. That's why most of us sitting here today, if not everybody, go back to Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe is identical with um, Poland, what used to be the Kingdom of Poland, because the old Kingdom of Poland that I'm talking about included the country city of Poland, plus Ukraine, plus Belarus, <coughs> plus Lithuania and Latvia. So that's what we call Eastern Europe. So I don't care if your parents came from Latvia or from this part or that part, it's all the Kingdom of Poland. Now, the Jews moved in right at that time in the 1500s. The Jews were allowed in by the kings, to whom they were one of the few sources of revenue, because the nobles didn't pay taxes. There were ways of collecting revenue. There were, but the Jews, like a special category, said they paid money straight to the king. Uh, and they were allowed in by the nobles, to whom they made themselves of service. If you're Jewish, you moved into Poland, didn't take you five minutes to figure who's in charge, and didn't take you 10 minutes to figure out the only way you're going to make a living if it's okay with the guys in charge. You find out who's the top dog, and you fit into that, or you die. The Jews brought certain uh, assets. As you can see, they were literate. At the time, a lot of people weren't. Not in English, in Hebrew, in Yiddish. They were literate, they were sober, okay? Uh, there were no threat to anybody. They were very good networkers because the Jews over the ages had to learn to be networkers, otherwise you don't stay in business. And they kept to themselves culturally, okay? And the Poles liked that. Basically, I only want to see you during work hours, and after that, get the heck out of here. I don't want no loud music, I don't want no nothing. Stay in your own neighborhoods all the way. That's exactly what the Jews wanted, you see? And so it was a perfect storm, as I always call it. And as a result, there never was any attempt to expel the Jews from the Polish Empire. On the contrary, the Jews prospered economically by inserting themselves, as I told you, into the nobles' economy, which was quite profitable for the nobles. And the Jews also increased demographically. It's the only place there was a baby boom. <clears throat> and there was a big baby boom there. So the Polish Jewish population is the only population that went like that. Okay, it's interesting. Not in Germany, not in Italy, not the Sephardim. It's interesting. And these Jews also exploded culturally. Poland became and remained the main Jewish community. I've talked in the past, and probably many of you were there, you talked about the 1500s, 1600s in Poland, from the from point of view, from the point of view of Torah literature, for Talmudic literature, it's a golden age. All the big rabbis were there, and the yeshivas were flourishing, and the Balabatim had money, and there are famous descriptions of all this. I'm not, you know, time precludes me from going into it. But many people, you know, you can do the Yvain Mitzula, who describes it in great detail. And uh, the bottom line is, these Jews in Poland <coughs> were culturally insular, but they made a lot of money. So who cares if it got, why, why somebody interested in college education? A Jesuit college education in Latin <coughs> in those years. By the way, Poland had their own golden age. <coughs> many people don't know. The university in Krakow is older than the universities in Germany. Like people think that Poland's like a backward country. It wasn't. But it was a screwball country because all the power was held by the nobles. And so, you know, you had to work within that system. Okay? Now, in the 1600s, things deteriorated because the Cossacks, the Tatars, the Swedes, and the Russians all ganged up to attack Poland, and they devastated much of the country, killing a lot of Jews along with a lot of Poles. This is what we call the Khmelnytsky stuff, but it was a lot more than just Khmelnytsky. The Cossacks attacked over here. The Prussians, believe it or not, attacked there. The Swedes, Sweden was once a great military power, came in and took over the whole doggone country. They called the Potom. And then, of course, the Russians made a major move. So Poland hit on all sides. 
The interesting thing is, although the country suffered a lot and the Jews also suffered a lot, it was terrible, uh, eventually they kicked him out. This is the interesting thing. You know, Poland lost a little bit of territory. Basically, they kicked all the invaders out. Now, although they didn't drive the enemies out, the invasions had the effect of weakening the country. By that, I mean the power of the state. Whereas in other countries, this period of time, the late 1600s, early 1700s, saw the strengthening of the royal central authority. So this is the age of Louis XIV in France. And he's sucking all the power to himself, which is what we call modern state. <clears throat> do you want in America that the different militias should have the power? Or do you want the federal government should have the power? You see, the definition of a modern country is <clears throat> the government has the power. So um, Poland, the nobles, this did not happen. The nobles were careful not to allow the kings to get too strong. Now, by doing that, they cut their nose. What's the expression? They cut their nose despite their face. But in Poland, even the next king, who was very heroic, he defeated the Turks, he saved Vienna, but he always had his wings clipped. And he was a great hero and a great friend of the Jewish people also, I might say, John Sobieski. Uh, but every time he tried to put an army or something together, they fought him and prevented him from doing so. So they didn't see themselves. Let me put it this way. So the Polish nobles are unequaled in their selfishness. You see? They're only interested in their own bottom line, their own do dollar. They didn't give a darn what happens to the rest of the country, so they lost their country. <clears throat> After John Sobieski, it's the 1690s, the nobles elected a German voluptuary prince, which who, who, who really was looking at just, just as an example, just as an example of a place that he can strut around as a king. So if his most famous claim to fame is the number of illegitimate children he fathered, that was Augustus the Strong, so you can understand that the country went to hell under his leadership. I'm not going into details, but you know, you'll take my word for it. And what was even worse, when he died, his son became the next king, who was even dumber and more voluptuary than the father. Uh, I haven't been in Warsaw, but it's very famous. They have what they call the Saxon Gardens. And these kings left behind a very pretty park because they were Saxons, you understand? But they didn't really care about Poland. So the country went to the devil. The nobles ran everything into the ground as far as their national interest is concerned. Now, for their own particular estates, they were very good. But they, as far as the country is concerned, the country doesn't exist. And uh, therefore, as a result, Poland's sovereignty became a joke. This is Peter the Great. This is Frederick the Great. Anytime they wanted to, I won't bore you with the details, they marched their armies right across Poland, in and out there, whatever they did, and Poles couldn't do anything. And many times in the Seven Years' War, the Frederick the Great was beaten, and they went into Poland, they stole everything, that way his army got food and supplies back. What are you going to do to it? What are you going to do with it? And Peter the Great earlier did that. So the country pretty much became a place that other countries can pretty much enter at will. You see, nobody's going to take them on. Now, uh, this is what the Poland themselves call their curse, which is they got bad geography. Poland is stuck between Prussia or Germany and Russia. Not a good position to be in. That's why Poland is the origin of that famous joke <coughs> where uh, three people are sitting on a park bench and a genie shows up. One's a Russian, one's German, one's Polish. And he says, everybody gets one wish. And the Russian says, wipe out Germany. And the German says, wipe out Russia. And they said, what do you want, Poland? He said, are they getting their wish? Yeah. He said, I'll take a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you see? But that's a joke. It really didn't work. So they were stuck in a bad place. I haven't mentioned Austria. There was something called the Austrian Empire we'll talk about before. They actually were good neighbors. They never had any wars between each other. The king of Poland rescued Vienna from the Turkish siege. They didn't have bad blood. Prussia and Russia, they had bad blood. OK? Now, again, skipping the details, time came when this was just like a, such an easy pickings that Russia and Prussia started the plot. They said, I can take a piece, you can take a piece. We're strong enough to do this. The international affairs is always a jungle. The international affairs is always a jungle. This is what's, what Putin has proved today. 
Nobody's stopping them. To an international fair, there's nothing by the jungle. The jungle, the weak don't survive, the strong survive. I mean, right now, if I would tell you a year ago it's going to be a war, you won't believe me. I wouldn't believe it. And this being the case, so it was only a matter of time before the two pounced on Poland. It was too strong to fight. Austria, as I said before, had been a good neighbor. But once these two started plotting to take pieces of Poland, I'll take a piece and you'll take a piece. So uh, what are you going to do about it? Well, there were three big powers in Eastern Europe at that time. There was Prussia, there was Russia, and there was also the Austrian Empire. And so in the good tradition of thieves, we want everybody to be happy. Nobody should make any trouble. I'll take a piece, you take a piece, and you can take a piece too. Like that. That way, we'll all be equal thieves, you get it? Like the mafia, you know, they want you to shoot somebody in order to join, in order to join. Now, to be perfectly honest, from the point of view of the Russians and the Prussians, they have what you call real politic. And it makes sense for them to do so. As I said many times, how come Napoleon lost? How come Hitler lost? Because they had to start over here. You get it? So by the time he came up to Moscow, it was already winter. Suppose they would have started here. You get, see what I'm saying? Then they would have gotten there much quicker. So if I'm Russian, down to Putin, I say, I need that place as a buffer zone. In case anybody attacks me, that will absorb the, the main thrust. And Prussia also, as you see, this is Frederick Drake's kingdom. If you notice, there's a gap in between, like between Gaza and the West Bank. You see? It's called Danzig Corridor. Uh, so Frederick the Great naturally said, I would like to hook it all up together. I'd like to add this to my kingdom. That way it'll be continuous and contiguous. So you can understand why they would do it. Uh, but Austria had no reason to do this, as we've seen before. The Austrian Empire is a country over. It had no interest. In, in fact, Poland is across the Carpathian Mountains. It's, across the youth mount, youth, big mountain range. So we have to then look, the West Shock Austria, which is something I'm gonna be seeing over and over again. Many people don't even know about this because it doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> Here I'm dealing with what they call the history of the Habsburg monarchy, which is a way professional historians call this. Because <clears throat> it wasn't called the Austrian Empire until the 1800s. There was a family called the Habsburgs. They were a, a, a noble family. They wanted to grab as much as they could just like everybody did. In Germany, you had a thousand different noble families, each one trying to kill the other to take over. The Austrians, or the Habsburg family, did a pretty successful job of it. And early on, in the 12 1300s, they had this, right? They're gonna have this later, but they started with this, which is roughly the size of Austria today, okay? So notice they were able to grab the Vienna area, Salzburg, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that is when the first of the Habsburgs put the famous rabbi in jail, and he died there, uh, the Marm Rottenberg. That's a famous story, he wouldn't let himself be ransomed. That was Rudolf of Habsburg, the real Mumser. But nevertheless, he was successful in founding the beginning of something which would expand. Then, 200 years later, let's go to the next one. They, they took over this, something called Bohemia, which is a big uh, kingdom next door to Austria by marriage. You see, they made the right marriage. They married the girl who's the heiress. She was actually heiress of two kingdoms. So they had a jackpot. When they married her, Ferdinand, the brother of Charles V, they married her. She was the heiress to the kingdom of Bohemia, which is what we call today the Czech Republic, but a lot more, because at that time, in addition to that, it also had Silesia. So if you roughly speaking, double the Czech Republic, roughly. So that's a nice chunk of territory. And you add that to Austria, your mama's got a piece of real estate. And then also, she was the heiress to the kingdom of Hungary, which once upon a time was very big, over here. So that means that what you call the Habsburgs, by the time we got to the 1500s, they own three big pieces which actually fit together because they're next door to each other. It's the Austria part, the kingdom of Bohemia part, <coughs> the Hebrew of Moravia, and then the Hungary part, which is a lot bigger, as I said before, than Hungary is today. So it kind of kind of makes sense, even though none of these three countries have anything to do with each other, really. Okay? Now, 
at the time they took it over, the Turks ruled Hungary, I won't bore you with all that. Eventually, they took, everything got together. Now, notice, how did they get all this territory? Legally, by marriage. It wasn't by conquering anybody and forcing them all the rest of it. They just played their cards right. There used to be a famous poem in Latin, two feel, uh, Berigenta, Gerontali, two Felix Austria, Nube. Let others fight work, thou happy Austria, Nube, you wed. Right? What, what Mars gives to others, Venus gives to thee. Okay? So, um, my point is like this. See, there was no attempt to take over Poland. You had the King of Bohemia, Canada, and next door is that big area of Poland. The old Catholics, anyway. You do your thing, we do our thing. Okay? Now, Austria went through a trauma in the 1740s and 50s, and they lost Silesia uh, to Frederick the Great, and they failed to regain in the Seven Years' of War. So they emerged tremendously disappointed. This is the history of, of Europe, in which these two, she was the Empress of Austria, he was the King of Prussia, and he just grabbed something when she became the Empress. She was 23 years old, she was kind of helpless. <clears throat> the Imams committed rape, and he said he could get away with it. She fought back very bitterly and had two wars. Uh, one's called the War of the Austrian Succession, the other one's called Seven Years' War, which we in America called the French and Indian War. <clears throat> and a lot of battles and stuff like that, she wouldn't let go. Tough luck for her. Frederick the Great was a military genius, and he won almost all the battles. She was up against that kind of bad luck. And so as a result, Austria felt very bad about having lost a big piece of territory, that big province of Silesia. And you see where I'm going with all this, OK? Because Frederick, as you see, this, used to, this whole area used to be part of Bohemia, part of the Austrian Empire. And then Frederick did like Putin. He just took it, you see? So Austria was all, you know, uh, traumatized. And uh, nevertheless, they realized they had to live with the loss of it. And now what do you do? The ruler of Austria was the greatest of the Habsburgs, the Emperor of Maria Theresa. I think she's the only woman. And she was the smartest of them all. It's interesting, because she had no education of being empress. And her father always wanted to have a son, but he never did. And so she, you know, to everybody's surprise, she took over. But she was pretty wise. Unfortunately, she hated the Jews. Right? But because she was a strong Catholic in that way, <clears throat> the old fashioned way. But um, <clears throat> nevertheless, she was a wise ruler. <clears throat> and uh, she put the country together. And because of her, there's an Austrian Empire. What's interesting is that, by the way, she was a strong Catholic. She had 16 children. Okay? She was the Empress. Uh, and uh, her, her husband died halfway through. And so she ruled with her son. Uh, yeah, let's go back one. Yeah, that one. That's the note of Yehuda. <clears throat> it's very interesting. She hated Jews. On the other hand, she wouldn't kill them or anything like that. If I'm the ruler, I got I can make extra taxes and all kind of rules. They were single like but you know you have to keep basic law and order. So when she died, he gave a very famous hesped, which is often reprinted. You'd think that she was an angel. Uh, now, some of it is you have to shoot the bull because you're under a, 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 a despotic system. But part of it was also that Jews appreciated law and order more than anything else. Because for a minority, there's nothing more dangerous than a breakdown in the law and order, as, as we've seen in this country from time to time. Okay? So, um, and he said, you know, it must be a minute she doesn't like us because she was very moral. She wasn't one of these people, you know, like Marie Antoinette, anything, who was her daughter, who didn't learn from the mother. She was a smart person, but uh, she didn't like Jews. She, her son became her co-ruler, Joseph II, uh, for 15 years. And he was much more progressive, and he was much more impulsive. And it's very interesting, you read the, the letters between them are there, and the son, let's do this and this, and the mother said, no, think about that. And they're fighting back and forth all the time, and you know, to, to her, he's just a young dummy, doesn't understand life yet. And from his point of view, she's an old this, and she, you know, she, she doesn't understand the new world. So this, Joseph II had a lot of influence. And he's the one who took over Galicia, that's my point. Okay? He yearns to acquire territory to make up for the loss of Silesia. He's therefore eager to participate in the first rape of Poland. At least we'll get a province back for the one we lost. The mother is shocked 
by the amorality, how could you just go and take another country? She was, as I said before, she wasn't stupid. She was a realist. But she was against simple aggression. It's wrong. You see? But eventually she agreed, right? Partially to keep the Russians farther away. They're saying if the Russians take all up to Hungary, it's not good. And so, you know, Frederick the Great says she cries, but she takes. And I get that. But by her it was a bit the and by her son it was al Khachil. And that screwball way is how, um, how should I put it? That's how this funny country called Austrian Empire took over Galicia. In 1772, the three thieves coordinated. The Russian army took over its part, marched in. The Prussian army took over its part and said, guess what? Poland was forced, and the Austrian army took in its part. Poland had their choice and was forced to agree. And this is called the first partition of Poland. This is the piece that Austria took. This is the piece over here that Prussia took. And that's the piece, Belarus mainly, that Russia took. So Poland was still left, but it was stripped of a lot of territory. Okay? Now, um, <clears throat> the Austrians, when they took over, they had no rights there. They claimed, you know, I mean, they concocted rights, you know, but not really. So what do you call this whole area? They said, we're going we're to create a brand new name for it, such as never existed before. We call it the Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria. Lodomir is Vladimir. And Galicia is named well, a small town, college. So they just created such a name, which shows the artificial nature of the whole thing. Okay? This begins the distinct story of Galician Jewry, because that's the year 1772, when this whole thing happened. Now, so far, I've talked about the Gaim, the non-Jews. Let's talk a little about the Jews there, which was a very large population in Jewish terms. In the old kingdom of Poland, there were no distinctions between Galicianers, Litvaks, and so forth. It was all Polish Jewry. This area was this part of Poland, that area was that part of Poland, but they all spoke pretty much the same Yiddish. Maybe they had a different accents, you know, but that's true of the United States or most countries. They were different accents, but it's basically the same culture. Okay? Uh, Lvov, Posen, Vilna. They're all cities, there was pretty much the same thing in terms of Jewish culture. You can see many famous rabbis from the 1500s. For a while he was in Lublin, then he ended up in Lemberg, then he ended up in Vilna. It, it, it's, it's like you would say in America, you go to Philly, then you go to St. Louis, Detroit, you know, it's all the U.S. You see? There wasn't such thing called Galaxy Honors. Right? I, mean, I, I think I just pointed out to you the very term word Galicia didn't exist. Right? So there hadn't been that. But from now on, there will be distinctions. That's my point. Partially due to the different imperial cultures. In other words, the one that's going to be ruled from Vienna is going to have one type of Jewish outcome. The one that's going to be ruled from Moscow or St. Petersburg is going to have a different one, as you can imagine. And the ones from Berlin will have its way. Curiously, Rabbi, I got a question. The state of Galicia also had Bolinia. Um, not really. We'll see. Well, I assure you. They said there was a council of the four lands. That's, way, that's in the old Poland. Okay. Not, it wasn't at this time. Okay. That was broken up. I'm going to get to that right now. Okay. okay. Now, curiously, the same 18th century decline in Polish central institutions, because Poland, as I say, little by little fell apart before it was taken over, the same grabbing of power by the local nobles at the expense of the state was paralleled in Polish Jewry. That's what this gentleman was talking about. They didn't realize it. Especially in Hasidism. Because Hasidus, Hasidism starts in the 1700s, and it, sort of like a termite, it takes away the power of the Kehila and of the central uh, institutions in favor of the local noble, which they'll call a Rebbe. You see, it's, it's funny. Um, so in the Galician territories, although there was no Galician territories, of course, that's where, um, meaning it wasn't called Galicia, that's where the Baal Shem Tov came from. That's where the Magen Mezrich and these people came from, for the most part. Mezrich is more like in your territory, in Valenia. But if you know who the Baal Shem Tov was in Podolia, these were all areas of the extreme eastern part. Today it's all called Ukraine, not Poland, but that time it was all part of the King of Poland. And this popped up, as we all know, in the years just before the uh, Austrian conquest. 
in the last years of the kingdom of Poland, when the country was mamish falling apart, and therefore the Jewish authorities itself was also falling apart. Because the state didn't exist or got weakened, then any idea of what you call the Council of the Four Lands, all the rest of it, is going to be weakened. So in other words, it's interesting, the parallels. The decline of the Polish state is equaled by the decline of the Vada Arba Rosos. The nobles and magnates grabbing power is equal to the Hasidic Rebbe's who do their own thing. They're not subject to any kahila. You get it? When you live in the old Poland, there were authority structures. If you live in this town, you have to follow the rulings of the local elected Jewish authorities in this town. If you're Catholic, you follow your local Catholic stuff and so forth. Not anymore. I can be following some Rebbe who lives far away, passes through every once in a while. And that's why I send the money to, and that's why I send all my support for. And even a certain aping of the Polish nobility, because the Hasidic style of a Rebbe with a Stickle Palace, retainers, that whole thing, that's the Polish nobles, even the dress, as we all know, is that of the Polish nobles. So it's just interesting how this played out. And even in the last years of the Kingdom of Poland, there were some political reformers who tried to fix things, but too late. They gave thoughts how to change the old ways of Poland. Same thing happens among the Jews. That's what we call the Maskilim in the 18th century. They say, how do we change the Jewish thing? <laughs> you understand? So, for example, you have uh, Mendel Leffen, who wrote a very famous, he wrote a whole bunch of books. This one is funny because uh, he wanted modernization, but on, and he opposed Hasidism, but he was, he was orthodox, and he wanted to be Shomer Shabbos, as you see over here. You see? And uh, what's funny is his writings were sufficiently good that Israel Israel Salanter in the 1800s was a big fan of this, which is why you see being published by Feldheim, even though the guy was the leader of the Haskell. He would, his book would never be published by the Hasidim. Now, um, one more piece. Rabbinic culture, <coughs> which flourished in Poland, I mean really flourished in Poland, uh, did so as an elite phenomenon. If you were from the few who knew how to learn, you had very good head, you came from a family that could afford to get you tutors, things like that, you're a player. Everybody else is just a watcher. You see? They don't know how, they can't read all these books. The concept of art school and such thing didn't exist even, you know? Even the Chayotum didn't exist. So how is anybody supposed to crack these books? Seriously, how is anybody supposed to even begin to crack these books if there's zero cheater books or anything like that? It doesn't exist. So um, as a result, I mean, the, the Kleiser Brody was the number one coal oil in the world in Galicia and Eastern, uh, in the Ukraine and places like that. The number one coal in the world, the rabbinate of Lvov, those are all these Gedolim, you know, I don't know, Peshua, what's the name, the Kachan Sri, all these famous names. Uh, the Kitsos was a rabbi in street in, in, in not far from the, in, the, in eastern Galicia. In an elite sense, it was a golden age. On the other hand, the elitism and distance from the masses was a turnoff. And as we know, it led to Hasidism. Because in Hasidism, at least you have face time with the Rebbe. And you say, what's the point of that? There's a point. You know, it's not like you don't exist. It's not like you don't exist. This is why in Galicia and elsewhere, the Hasidic movement popped up in Poland. Now, here we are in 1772. The Austrians are now the new rulers. <clears throat> they don't even know what it is they have in their hands. Joseph II says, Let's grab as much territory as you can. And they survey their new territory. <clears throat> and they're like shocked because they're Germanic and they're used to order. <clears throat> and this is what the first governor says <clears throat> The Jews sell unripe lumber and extortionate profit in a high demand market, which they got from the Ukrainian peasants who stole it from the forest of the Polish nobles, they're legally appropriated from the royal domains. So everybody's stealing from everybody. It's almost like Baltimore, you know? <laughs> and so, now, you have to understand something. <clears throat> That's how he used to do business for hundreds of years over there. So, I don't know, it worked, you get it? One of the reasons it worked was the, the, the natural resources are endless. The forests were endless. The territory, the, 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 the ground is unbelievably fertile. There are rivers. There are endless mines of, of, of ore. And so, you still hear this and the other. And I've told you many times also, and the whole country 
<clears throat> was like a pure capitalism. Pure capitalism. The whole doggone country of Poland from one end to the other was one gigantic flea market. And everybody's handling all the time. And that's how life was lived. But as we know from pure capitalism, it has its plus sides and its minus sides. That's why all these towns in eastern Poland the other way, actually quite, kind of build up. They're not what you call little shtetls like the fiddle on the roof. If you ever see pictures of them, I've been, I was there. You know, you see, now I'm not talking about the big cities like Lemberg. I'm talking about smaller places. They're well-constructed um, uh, cities. Uh, they're, they're not nothings. They have street, paved streets and so forth. The money was flowing. It worked for them. You get it? The Jews had their slot. These guys had their slot. There is their slot. Then basically, you know, not to be funny about it, you could get whatever you wanted. With it. It's not exactly Amazon, but it wasn't far from Amazon. Because you could, you could get whatever you want just a matter of time. You see, a guy said, I guess, I need combs. It'd be some Jewish guy said, give me a week. I need feathers. I need wax. I need this. I need f f fancy Jew uh, shoes from France. Because we're having a wedding. It, it pops up. Now, obviously, it's a profit motive. It was a pure profit. Now, the nobleman is taking off the top. Do you get it? So the nobleman encourages this. They get their piece off the top. So they don't have to do the work, and they get it. But this is how the economy worked. Not after they divide up Poland. Then each one of the conquering powers sets up tariff, and they close the frontiers. They have this protectionism. They have the opposite of capitalism. They have micromanagement and part of the government. And all the economies went down the tubes. Okay, so in the beginning, they didn't even know what they had in their hands. The new rulers, who were Austrian officials and bureaucrats of the Empress Maria Theresa, they tried to impose German order, Ordnung. Okay, they are inspired by the latest political thinking of that era. I might even say the liberal political thinking of the middle 1700s, in which they speak about the Polizeistaat and the Reichstag. The police state and the state of law. Uh, the state of law is something we also believe in, which is it should be a country of laws and not a people. Okay? So notice the little guy has some chance. Maybe not a big chance, they got a chance. And a police state doesn't mean the Gestapo. A police state means the government regulates everything. They know better. Okay? These are the big fights the U of Hyatt had in the Jewish community in Baltimore and elsewhere and all around the world in the last two years, on the masks, right? Half the people say like this, they should regulate, make everybody wear masks all the time, this and the other, because the science is that. And the other people say, get your hands over me, you know, like that. So the first would be in favor of Polizeistadt. And when the corona first popped up, everybody agreed. Well, most people did anyway. You know, they said, it's, it's, it's dangerous, you see? Remember, we thought at that time, if you touch something, okay. okay, okay. No, it's according to the latest knowledge. So this was the Austrians coming to a place where it has none of this. We're making rules and regulations and orders and so forth and so on. Okay? Uh, under Austrian rule, it will be bureaucratic absolutism. So it knows the government gives orders and the bureaucrats are there to make sure you do them. <clears throat> but it's not exactly a czarist dictatorship. Okay? Not really. The Jews will have to maneuver within the system. <clears throat> but they were already living in Eastern Europe. They were used to maneuvering within the system. As you just saw yourself, this guy bought it from the peasant who stole it from him. To, uh, <clears throat> That's how they did it. In an arrogant way, the Austrian officials mean well. They're coming from Vienna, a place like that, and they say, this is all uncivilized. It's no good. We'll show you how to do it. In other words, <clears throat> there's a classic uh, paternalism. You don't know what's good for you. I know what's good for you. <clears throat> you doggone bell better do what I tell you what's good for you, or I'll punish you. In America, we call it parents. You understand? <laughs> now, um, so in their way, they mean well. So for starters, they strip the Polish nobles of their despotic power. They say, you can't just do what you did until now. It was like the old South. You, just, you, feel, you feel like you shoot somebody today. This board. You the, the, they had their power. And the Austrians say, you can't go beat up somebody, kill them just for the heck of it. You understand? And the nobles said, why not? He said, well, it's a new day, baby. So for the peasants, it was a big upgrade. You get it? They didn't make them equal. They still kept the nobility and all that. But compared to the unbelievable 
despotism. You know, I mean, a Polish noble and his wife might say like this, I want to experiment with being a dentist. Come here, pull the teeth, you know? We have no idea what Mishagas they could do. So they also say, you can't do this, okay? Um, they disband the private armies of the nobles. Every guy had a private army, because they had huge estates, and a couple thousand men. They also say, you can't have private armies over here. Who's going to protect me? Saying, well, send your soldiers. Tell me how many you need. But of course, soldiers listen to the Austrians. You see? So they're trying to introduce what you and I would agree with would be a civilized society in a, a wild west of the old days. Okay? Um, they try to make the nobles pay taxes because you're benefiting from what we do also. And second of all, we're running the country. You can be sure the nobles give them a hard time with that. Okay? So they're trying to create what they regard as a civilized, normal country. Uh, to some degree, the Ukrainian peasants, because they're the ones that really took it in the chin, and Polish also, are better off now because they can't just be totally toyed with. But you know something? Without thoughtful land reform, which is very difficult, it's going to be a bruckle about to a waste of time. One of the hardest things to do is pull off a successful land reform. <clears throat> MacArthur did it in Japan after where he had his Jewish guy from Colombia. It's very difficult because if you give out, you say like this, these guys own thousands of acres, give it out to all the peasants. If each guy gets too small of a portion, won't be able to make a living on it either. Anyway, second of all, small things are not efficient. It's actually better to have a large area like we do in this country. No farmers left in America, the agribusiness took it over. True or not, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and anyway, you give out the land to the peasant, some smart guy will get him drunk, he'll sell it back. You know what I'm saying? And he's gonna have children, how are you gonna subdivide that? So it takes a great deal of chachma <coughs> to do successful what you want, which is a successful land reform. When you do that, then all of a sudden you've turned all the peasants into supporters of conservatism. It's called the wager of the strong. Do you follow what I'm saying? because now they're invested in the system. It's so one of the great achievements of the US was they did a, a successful land reform in Japan, <laughs> okay? Not in this country. Uh, and usually it doesn't work, it didn't work with the Austrians either. And so, um, let's put it this way, the agriculture will be very backwards and very inefficient. And the only reason I'm telling you is this, there'll be a lot of starvation in Galicia, including a lot of Jews. So every year in the 1800s, <coughs> Several thousand Jews will die from starvation. Also Poles and Ukrainians. This is one of the reasons some of you may be related, uh, uh, descended from Hungarian Jews in like Eastern Hungary, you know, in Transylvania, Marmaris, those places. They ran away to Hungary way back when from Galicia because in Hungary the, the society was better organized. <coughs> he didn't starve to death. Not necessarily be a millionaire, but he didn't starve to death. You see in Galicia, it was tough. We'll talk about that more in the future. Okay? There's an urgent need for revenue from the Austrians, obviously, to run the occupation. Uh, the occupation is, of course, expensive. Now, Maria Theresa and her son turned their attention after the nobles and eventually get to the Jews. Personally, as I told you before, she hated the Jews because she considered them all rip off artists. Look what she says I know no greater plague than this race. Okay? And what she meant was, if you leave the Jews alone, they'll buy up all the land, they'll go into usury. There was truth, excuse me, there was truth to this. You see? So it's very tricky, these issues. On the other hand, by acquiring Galicia, she doubled the size of Jews in her country. She used to have 70 and 80, she used to have altogether 150,000. And when she got Galicia, she took another 150,000. So if somebody doesn't like Jews, they got a booby prize. On the one hand, they were here. And as their queen, she did feel responsible for their welfare. But in her bureaucratic, despotic way, she thought to bring the order to Jewish life vis-a-vis -vis the state. That's the best way to go. And if the Jews did not appreciate her efforts, it just showed you what a bunch of jerks they are. Bringing order, of course, meant discriminating against Jews in general but making exceptions for those Jews who benefit the economy. So anybody who sold, who was supplying food for the army, 
organizing the state lottery, helping out, you know, somewhere or another, which is exceptional. They were given privileges. Everybody else can rock. One thing, though, was short, not going to be no state within a state. We're not going to have these Cahillas like they used to have when they run their own affairs. Everything is under the Austrian state. So she set up a whole system, tried to, with a chief rabbi who's supposed to be like archbishop. Everybody has to listen to the chief rabbi, and chief rabbi has to listen to her. Okay? So in other words, basically, she wanted to turn all the Jewish Cahillas, which are famous, and there were 300 of them in Galicia, into a Judenrat, like the Germans did. Now, I don't mean in the Hitler way at all. Nevertheless, they should become an instrument of the state. You see? So that the Austrian government can use it to control the Jewish religion, which the Jewish religion had traditionally benefited from extreme decentralization. <laughs> I tell you, the Jews always say, I guess, I don't want nobody paying attention to what we're doing in our community. We'll pay the dog on taxes. Tell me how much we're talking about. We'll come to some kind of agreement and just leave us the heck alone. And it used to be that these Christian governments say like this, Jews are so stupid, so nothing. I don't even want to know what goes on in their dumb communities. They just say, good. Now it's a new day. And the government's like this, where do you live? How many people in your family? How much tax do you pay? What's your occupation? You know, let me see your W-2 forms and all the rest of it. That is not what the Jews like. The, she was smart. She knew that the Nota the most, uh, it was the biggest rabbi in the Austrian Empire, which was true. And she actually said, I want you to be the chief rabbi of Galicia. Right? Because you'll have the authority and maybe pull it off. He wanted to do it, but in the end he didn't do it. And later he was glad he didn't do it. Because he would have ended up being like a, a, a tool of the Judenrats. You understand? Um, so basically, as we go to the next one, you'll see, the Maria Theresa would say, uh, you can't do any excommunication for now. You can't put in a harem, except when I tell you to. Here's who you should put in religious excommunication. The chief rabbi does it, and he exercises on the supervision of the government, so you should, you, and you should excommunicate evaders of taxes, Smugglers are deserters from military service. You see what I'm saying? You want to use the tools of the Jewish religion, but for state purposes. It's a classic uh, enlightened despotism kind of move. You want the religion there, but you want it till you can use it. Okay. Now, um, this is all part of what we call the Pufendorf police state. Pufendorf was a famous uh, professor, the German professor in the 18th century, who talked about the police state and again, they mean police state in the good sense, as they see it. And so Maria Theresa applied paternal government in its most minute details to the internal life of the Jews. She even gave regulation, which Mesechta everybody should learn that year. That's so Germanic. You say you want to control everything. She devised the rules for bestowing titles of Chabaredo. She wanted to control the smicha process. You get it? And for granting licenses for the reader and the shokit. He wanted to control the Kabbalah process. You followed? So the equivalent would be, you'd have a star K in Baltimore, but to be a government bureaucrat who's sitting in the office there behind us to run everything by. You see, that is the Austrian, Prussian, old-fashioned, 18th century way. That's how they did it. This was the beginning of, some, of a series of decrees which deprived the Kehilos of their autonomous course of status, which once upon a time had been the glory <coughs> A Polish Jewry. I am hoping in the three weeks we just worked out the details, me and Shmuel Tarshish, to do a series in the three weeks on um, the history of the coercive, the Jewish coercion uh, down the centuries. The, the old Kehillus and how the Jewish courts administered religious coercion, even though that's a dirty word today. Once upon a time, they all gloried in it. But once the Austrians take over, they deprive them of this power. Uh, contrast the status of the Jews under the king of Poland with the new Austrian reality under Joseph II, who succeeds his mother as the Austrian emperor. The Jews used to, as I say before, by their conditions, had it good. We pay the taxes, maybe it's a little extra money. <coughs> they tax them heavily, okay. But they also let them make money in ways they wanted. So I can handle the heavy taxes. You see? And in return for that, we do whatever we want. You live in a town, here are the Jews, here are the Christians, they work it out, however they work it out. <clears throat> Truth of the matter is, the only person they had to deal with was the guy who owned everything, the, the, land, the, the, the nobleman. Because in Poland, with few exceptions, 
a single guy or a single girl owned the whole town and the whole province. And that's how it worked. You know what I'm saying? And that's how it worked. I know I've told this story many, many times. To give you an example I'm talking about, in 1744, when um, you had the city of Brody, which is eastern uh, Galicia, now Ukraine, and was very much a commercial entrepot. And those, they had Jewish merchants there who had international connections. And Mrs. O'Leary's cow, uh, you know, knocked over the fire and the old town burned down. Because in those days, you built everything out of wood because that was the, 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 the most available substance. And the whole town burned down. All these guys have been millionaires who were ruined. Okay? The owner of the town was Prince Potutsky. <laughs> You've heard of Potutsky. And he owned the whole area, like more or less half of Maryland. <clears throat> and he heard about it. <clears throat> he summoned the top five or ten merchants who were broke now as a result of the fire, <clears throat> come to the palace, and he opened up a safe and gave each guy in cash what you and I today would call $100,000. Something in that area. Not as a loan. But why did he do it? He didn't like Jews. They didn't like him. He's a Catholic. They're Jewish. What's that got to do with anything? What's that got to do with anything? You see? He was an intelligent steward of his own economic interests, and he realized if you give some loser $100,000, he'll blow it in Vegas in two weeks. Right? He'll buy himself this, that, and the other. But if you give a businessman, if you give a business person $100,000, they'll put it into their business. Right? You put it into their business. And so, and remember, at that time, the Jews were sober, <clears throat> not like today. And so it's because the Jews were sober and didn't drink that they ran all the bars. That's why the, Roman, <clears throat> the Polish Roman gave them all the bars to run. That was the reason. You couldn't give it to the others drink the merchandise. <laughs> it was true. It's Eastern Europe. May I point out, Jews never <clears throat> encountered booze in their history until they came to Eastern Europe. The Jews always lived in <clears throat> Middle East and in Southern and Central Europe. <clears throat> That's wine. See? Whiskey, vodka, that kind of doesn't exist. Only when they moved to those regions they discovered these whiskey things which the nobles use. It's like a monopoly. You know, like company towns used to be years ago. The workers and the peasants will buy it at the local store and they'll, they'll take money that way. So these are all the screwball situations of the economics that worked once upon a time. And what I'm trying to say is that the Jews did okay under that system. There were a lot of poor Jews, but there were also a lot of middle class Jews. You see? And the best part was nobody bothered them, as it were. The government couldn't care less what they're doing, yeshivas, all the rest of the Jews liked it the way. Now it's a different day. Now every school has to register with the government. They send inspectors. They want to know what's going on. They're angry that the Jews aren't keeping their books in German. It's all in Yiddish, which nobody can read. They say, Jews don't want to show the books to the guys. Jewish attitude you, is the old one. They never paid their tax individually for a thousand years. You always paid your taxes through the community. And so let's say it was Brody for our top of the let's say, let's say the government said we want $2 million. OK, so you told me the number. And now leave it to us how to raise that $2 million. It's not your business. You will get cash on January 1 or whatever the date is. You'll get your cash. How to have it? And it used to be the king's I guess, fine. Don't got to pay it to uh, internal revenue. Don't have to deal with unions, no pensions. They get the money like that. Now it's a different story. So it's considered very, you know, uh, bothersome. So the story I was telling was that they gave each guy $100,000. They went right away to Germany, to Leipzig, where they had the great fairs, <coughs> commercial fairs of yesteryear. Each one had cash. If you know what kind of deal you get with the cash. They bought a, a, a huge amount of goods. It was eventually shipped back to Brody. They started rebuilding the town from scratch. It took four or five years, maybe. And the town was double what it was. The business coming in was double and triple what it was. They were trading with China and with Connecticut. Wow. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to tell you. They were trading with China and Connecticut. So, the, so what's the point? The guy who gave out $500,000, $600,000, he saw that 10 times over. So it wasn't he liked them. That's how he did business in the old days. This one happened under Austria, just like one happened in America. OK? So anyway. <clears throat> um, Mind you, the Austrians did not abolish the kehillahs. They turned them into instruments of the bureaucracy. 
primarily the Austrians were interested, of course, in co-opting the richy rich. The Rabbonim, they wanted to turn into functionaries and officiants, because that's what the Catholic clergy is, whose wings could be, were indeed being clipped at the time of Joseph II under something called Josephinism. Many people don't realize that the real brain trust under Maria Theresa and Joseph was ex-Jew, the Chazin who converted, Alvaz von Sonnenfeld and his son Joseph von Sonnenfeld. Once they became Catholics, all doors were open to them, and they rose to be the number one advisors of Maria Theresa and uh, Joseph II. And they the ones who came up with all these ideas that the state should take over everything from the church. You see? And they're very famous in Austria. Statues in Austria, all the rest of it. They used to call them Austrian Disraeli. And they're the ones engaged in, in turning the Austrian state as much as they can into a powerful uh, organism. Okay? Now, uh, Zonnefels is mainly the one who put this idea of the Rechstadt, which is, it's not the local noble does whatever you want. There are laws, the rules and regulations, and you stick with the rules and regulations. Okay? Now, in general, I'm presenting a very complicated story today. That's my point. Maria Therese and her son claimed that they were intending to better the lot of everyone, including the Jews. And in a few areas, as I told you, they improved things. However, their mindset was so anti-Semitic and so intent on prioritizing their own power, their own control and revenue, the, the effect was very, very bad for the Jews. Because mainly, and first and foremost, they wrecked the economy. And they wrecked the economy by these artificial borders, as you can see over here, the, re, the, the point of the map is as follows. This used to be all Poland. So if I lived here, I did trade here, 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 all over the place. Do you get what I'm saying? Let's say I was, like I said before, selling wax or fur, and I live in Lemberg. But I'm trading with Vilna, with Posen, with Warsaw, with Minsk, and so forth and so on. And it's one big free trade zone, because all of Poland was one big area. Now, the Austrians set up an artificial barrier, the Russians put up an artificial border. The Germans put up an artificial border. I can only sell in Maryland. I used to have a business I was selling in 50 states. Now I can only sell in Maryland. You see? But that's the mindset of the bureaucratic absolute state. And so they killed the economy. Now, they would never take responsibility for that. If you kill the economy, it's really dangerous if you have an expanding population and a shrinking economy. That's a revolution start. You get it? Or if they don't, then people starve. I mean, that's what happens. There's no work. There's no work. Okay? So, um, first of all, they wrecked the economy. The mother and son, Maria Therese and her son, claimed that they wouldn't make the Jews equal. But what they meant by that was, among other things, now they're subject to conscription, to being drafted. Part of the old system was Jews were not part of the country. They just lived there, maybe in ghettos, things like that. As they say, they paid their taxes collectively and so on and so forth, and they weren't drafted because they're not French, they're not German, they're not Polish, they're not, you see? The wars are for the national people. The Jews aren't part of that. They're wimpy, call whatever you want. But Jews say, I guess I'll take that because my kids don't get drafted in the army. <laughs> After all, who today, raise your hand if you like being in the army. Raise your hand if you like being boot camp. Tell me who would like to be Austrian boot camp in the 1700s. <laughs> Russian boot camp. Matter of fact, I'm sure there are people in this audience whose grand grandparents ran away from the draft back in the old country. You see? I don't blame them. So now you say, oh, I want to keep you equal. So therefore, never gets drafted. So I, I don't want the equality, I don't want the draft. You see? But it didn't matter. So that's why this new decree was experienced as a nightmare by the Jews. And they basically said, thanks a lot. You know? You tell me you're an enlightened ruler, you're introducing reforms, you're equalizing the Jews. I prefer inequality, to tell you the truth. We like the old system, okay? The, there's a famous incident in Prague where the Notre Dame was asked by the government to give a pep talk to the recruits, to the first Jewish conscripts. And you can read the speech and you, you see he's forced to say, he's forced to say, and the newspapers, I guess, oh, he was crying with joy as he addressed the recruits. He was crying, all right. It wasn't with joy. You understand? Now, I'm just trying to show you the clash. In addition to these stupid tariffs, the Austrians quadrupled the taxes on the Jews. 
which drove poor family starvation. Or you ran away to Hungary or someplace like that. Or by the way, to Romania. A lot of people ran away to Romania. These taxes were disgusting, especially what they call the candle tax, the light tax. Look at this. A light tax was introduced when every light burned for religious purposes. So, you know, Jews, as we all know, like, if possible, you like to light enough candles like the people in your family, something like that, right? No such thing. Now imagine a poor family. They can't afford to do that. And we'll see, they farmed the taxes out, which is they sold the right to collect the tax to Jews. So these Jews will go from house to house for the next 100 years. Even a poor family said, you can't light the candles if you didn't pay the tax. So it was a nightmare, you see? No, you're penalizing. On every light burned for religious purposes, like on Chavez, and every oil lamp burned the anniversary of death of relatives, do you, do you light a candle on a yard site? They're going to tax you on that. You see? On every candle used in the synagogue on the Day of Atonement, on every Hanukkah light, and every candle lit at a wedding, <coughs> you see it? Only dealing with This tax ranged from a half price for Hanukkah light to a florin. Florin's like 10 bucks. <coughs> For a torch at a wedding, the great source of annoyance, $10, <clears throat> I don't mean $10 today, $10 then, right? It was real money. But it, so basically, they're attacking the mitzvahs. Look at the next one. They established a present 4,000 florins of the Jews for importing esrog, right? So in other words, they hit the Jews where it counts. And that's my point. <clears throat> there were similar taxes that they now impose on kosher meat. And again, they farmed it out. So, you know, you buy the right to collect the tax. Every time anybody buys a piece of meat or a chef or whatever they do, they hit with taxes. It was terrible. In other words, a disgusting system to screw over the Jews for practicing their religion. The entire system naturally created a whole network of mukusim and delatoria, informers, snitches. Well, this kind of system brings out the worst. Like I said before, if I... Let me put it this way. I don't have a job. I, go, I get a job working for a tax farm. He says, your job is to patrol this area. Anybody lights a candle, find out. Or any, any lady buys a chicken, something like that. For everyone you get, you know, it's like, it's like when they say like this. You tow a car, you, you know, they, they get, the, the, the towing company gets money out of it. You see? This is what I'm trying to say. So uh, let's put it this way. What a terrible contrast to the old kingdom of Poland. None of this ever existed. In the old days, for hundreds of years, they worked out how much the community pays the government. The government typically, this went throughout Jewish history, the government would say, we expect $3 million from you this year. Three million bucks. There was a famine. There was an invasion. My kids are sick. 1.6. They said they finally worked out a number, and, they, and, they, and that they kept. You see? So it's a much more realistic and flexible system used to be. It's also true that the Austrians honestly thought that the Jews were nothing but chunk. And so basically, as the famous historian said, the policy towards Galician Jews from the time of annexation rested on two principles, reducing their rate of increase, like how to make sure that they don't have so many babies. That's a government policy. And implementing means aimed at their moral, religious, and cultural <clears throat> improvement. So basically, Judaism stinks. How do we make you civilized? That's how it has. I will discuss in what's left tonight three areas in which the new rulers <coughs> interfered in Jewish life, and then we'll carry this in tomorrow. Uh, they, again, the Austrians said they intend to prove things, improve things, but ended up making a mess with bad results for Yiddishkeit. The three areas they interfered with was the rabbinate, marriage and divorce, and Germanization. First, the rabbinate. First of all, they made a law that nobody can be a rabbi of a community unless there's a college degree <coughs> that was fluent in German. How many people in 1790? The Yiddish doesn't count. By the way, Galciano Yiddish definitely doesn't count, <laughs> right? Very far from German. So who qualifies for this? Nobody. No rabbi in the 1780s could do this. <coughs> and anyway, it doesn't make any sense. Who is the rabbi in the 1780s? The Kitsosa Hoshan, one of the most famous rabbinical scholars. Are they right? who was, in, in fact, appointed a Kreisrabbiner, a district rabbi by the Austrian government. He needs to have a college degree in German in order to be a rabbi? The answer is, 
the government doesn't want a rabbi. They want a bureaucrat. You understand? In other words, we want you to tell your people what we tell you to tell your people. That ain't the Jewish way. Okay? The Jews did not want to acquiesce. The Austrians would not give in. There weren't rabbis like that available. And anyway, what are you going to do? Does that mean that the community should not have a rabbi altogether? That's not what the government wanted, because they want somebody to maintain morality and so forth. And when such rabbis later on were available, from Germany, let's say, they weren't from enough to be accepted by the Galician communities, because they were pretty religious. Even the Maraschias. Let's go to the next one. Right? Who was actually a from guy, not by the standards of Galicia. Wow. They ran him out on a rail because they had a college education. Now, he took it by cleft test. He didn't actually go to college. But he did get the degree. That was it. You see, he's a pretty religious looking guy. And yeah, he's in the back of Gamar. I'm just trying to tell you this is called forcing. You push me, I blow back. You push me, I push back. That's the way it went. Okay? So everybody naturally had to seek exemptions, okay? Which the Austrians reluctantly granted. Now I'll tell you something. The Austrian officials were not so bribable. So it's not like you pay them off. In Russia, they settled the old fashioned way. Come with me, come with me into the next room. <laughs> you know, they, let's, let's, let's go to the back and discuss this. It didn't really work like that with the Austrians. And so basically you had to file papers to get an exemption that this guy should be allowed to be a rabbi in this is town even though he doesn't have a degree because of this and this emergency reason or this exigency or things like that. And since the authorities were not granted exemption too often, communities simply started not having a rov, a chief rabbi of the town, not a real one, not someone with charismatic authority. And having a rov with charismatic authority had always been an essential component of Jewish ordinance, of Jewish law and order. How do you keep a community not tearing itself apart. It has to be some kind of system of charismatic authority. Jews had large numbers of children and all the rest of it. If there's not a respect for parents, for elders, for the rabbi, for this and the other, everybody become a juvenile delinquent. The girls are going to do this and the other, which is what's later going to happen in, in Galicia. See, so the government, once again, sabotaged its own interests. This had terrible consequences, especially in the breakdown of the traditional family structure. As I said before, uh, in the context of numerous children, and as you see over here, uh, Galicia will later on become, I'm sorry to say, one of the main centers of Jewish prostitution around the world. Because the whole, the whole, what do you call it, system of, of respect for traditional authority collapsed, and the result is that young people can be easily taken advantage of. And they were, because there's money in it. Okay. So it was kind of productive. T to tell you the truth, this would happen in Israel with Ben-Gurion and the Malbara, as we all know. Right? Uh, what happened? What's the sin against the Sephardim? They came to Israel. They put them in all these situations. They destroyed the traditional family structure. So Jews would come from Yemen, Iraq, Morocco, with five, ten children. But in the old country, if the mother and father said something, that's it. In a new country, they say, don't listen to parents. They're fighting duddies. They're over the hill. Okay, so you've got a bunch of teenagers and whatever running around. Pretty soon, they're going to end up in trouble. And the police have trouble in their hands. Now, that's interfering with the rabbi. Now, the marriage and divorce, which is a very complicated story, but I'm going to give you the basics. That's a whole series by itself. The Austrians were always afraid there's going to be too many Jews. In Bohemia, where they had 30,000, 40,000 Jews, you know, Prague and those places, so there, it was a smaller population and much more police control. <clears throat> and so the Austrians, early on, enacted what they call these familiant laws, which means only one person in the family is allowed to get married. See? And there better not be any illegitimate children running around. So what's everybody else in the family supposed to do? Tough luck. Why don't you leave? That's where you get your Hungarian Jews from. So you ran away <clears throat> from Bohemia, the ones that couldn't get married, ran to a country called Hungary next door or somewhere else. In the 1800s, they ran to a place called USA. Maybe you heard of it. Because these laws didn't get rid of until 1848. So they tried to do that with the quarter million Jews or whatever in Galicia. Hasidim. Good luck, baby. Okay? Uh, 
there's a long and bitter parsha of Joseph II, who meant well in his mind, but was so doggone obtuse and stupid and bureaucratic. I mean, he issued 17,000 laws during his reign. He was king for, for nine, 10 years. So the guy was a micromanaged freak. You see? Uh, he tried to control Chuppa Kedushin and Gittin. Notice he said like this. My officials can be justice at a peace. And if the Jewish law calls for, you know, a chuppah al we'll set a chuppah by the justice of the peace. And you don't need a rabbi. We'll have the Austrian officials do it all. He didn't even get it. You understand? He wanted his officials to administer even Chosha Mishpat. We don't need Jewish courts at all. If you have religious issues, Moses Mendelssohn had written for the Prussian government earlier, like a kitzer, you might say, a digest of the Jewish civil law. We can use that. This is how he thought, you understand? And um, basically, the emperor wanted to eliminate the rabbis, have Austrian judges, be uh, Masada Gittin, <laughs> issue all the divorce regulations, which in the Jewish religion is considered very serious business. It's got to be done just so. And obviously, it's only got to be done by believing Jews, because after all, it's a religious document. Not to him. In his weird way, he thought, the emperor, that he was helping by micro, be, being a micromanaging control freak, but he always made things worse, which is why all the people came to hate him, even though he said, I'm doing everybody a favor. As I just said before, look at the next one. <laughs> 17,000 long. And by the time he was, uh, in fact, it broke his heart. But the whole empire went into revolution. The Hungarians didn't try to, didn't like what he's doing to the Hungarians. The Bohemians didn't like what he's doing to the Bohemians. The Romanians didn't like what he did in Transylvania, and so on and so forth. So instead of everybody liking it, the whole place was in revolt, and his brother had to be Mavatha in most of it. Worst of all, the Jews bitterly resented the laws, setting up all kinds of bureaucratic hoops before you could get a marriage license, which didn't apply to all the other guys who didn't have to go through all this job. Now, they thought the Jews would roll over and play possum, you know? It worked in Bohemia. You, have, you can't get married unless you have a high school degree and you pass a law, memorize a certain catechism, all the rest of it. Really? You want to try that in Galicia? You know, 200,000 Jews, 300,000, are you going to try that? It never occurred to these idealistic rulers and bureaucracies that familiar laws, all the things that go along with them, which didn't apply to anybody else, is unnatural. Right? It's not natural. People want to get married for a whole bunch of reasons. But I'm just saying from the physical perspective, what's, it, what's your plan exactly? You see? Local bureaucrats on the, on, on the spot warned Vienna about it, but Vienna, the imperial government, went back off. And so the result was, they said, the heck with it. Well, how about you call still a chuppah, silent chuppah, in which you just have illegal marriage, meaning you have chuppah kedushin, which works by Judaism. So you have, you don't even need a rabbi, by the way. They have a chas and a kali, you have the 10 people there to be witnesses, they give the ring and so on and so forth. But it's very bad. It breaks down the institution of marriage. It turns the whole institution of marriage into a joke. I get it that somebody can say this. If it works by us, it works by us. We don't care what the others think. But if you had to hide it from the police and you say, who's this lady living with you in your house? And you have to lie and so on and so forth. It debased the, what should be the most sacred of all institutions. It's in the interest of the state. Don't you agree? To maintain the sanctity of the institution of marriage as a stabilizing factor in society. Now, maybe you're not allowed to say that in this day and age, but, but let's just go back 20 years. Yeah. Right? This, the, 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 that used to be, I'm, what I'm trying to say is like this. Even if states aren't due for religious reasons, they're for social reasons. Here you're undermining that, okay? And so as a result, what happened? Everybody's illegitimate because nobody got married legally. You see? And there's a famous story of Yasla Roosevelt. He was born in Ukraine. There was a from guy, and he ends up getting a job in German. His son wrote, you know, Rabbi Rosenbach, who used to be the rabbi, then Beth Philip. So he wrote a biography of his father. And early in his career, he was a rabbi in Hamburg. We had a great voice, as we know. And so he got in Germany. Germany was under the Kaiser time, everything very organized. And so a social worker came to the house and said, This is a scandal. I'd be arrested. Why? You were not married? He said, What I married? Here's my kisub, all the rest of it. He said, But you don't have. Austrian document, literally living in sin. You understand? So I'm trying to say, this is a crazy thing, 
and neither side would back off. It's one of the most famous aspects of Galician Jewry. Right? After 90 years or so, the familiar law was abolished, but the bad habits were already ingrained among the Jews. And even when you didn't have all these regulations anymore, it just became a minhag. Do you just have like a private club? Nobody got married. I mean, nobody, but most people didn't get married. Regular way. You understand? And basically, I guess if everybody in the town is illegitimate, then nobody is. You see, you do like that. So, again, this was disastrous on many levels. The historically honorable and proud status of the Jewish wife was undermined. Okay? Uh, she had to be hidden as far as taxes and other things, and to be more like a concubine situation. The Jewish laws are challenging as it is as far as the women is concerned. This made things even worse in terms of the fact that someone could take really advantage of a, of a woman, especially a girl, with all kinds of things, Kedusha Ischok and Kedusha Ischita. Notice you persuade a girl at a young age to accept a, a Kedushan. The community isn't regulating this anymore. Next thing you know, she's 10, 12, 14 years old, whatever. Now she's married to a guy. Maybe he wants to blackmail her family into getting money for, to get a get. Maybe it's even worse, like in the 1800s, when the guy married her in order to lure her to go with him to South America, where he dumps her in some kind of brothel. Things like that. These things happen. In other words, the sanctity of marriage is very important for the status of the woman. You follow? And when it became, as a result of all these screwball situations, that the marriage itself became something done under the table, as we call it over here. So it was, it was, it, it, it terribly, uh, Cause the status of the women to deteriorate, because even in the best of times, the Jewish laws are, as you know, it's too it's too hard to get divorced and too easy to get married in Judaism. Okay, and finally, as I said before, it facilitated these people taking advantage of them. Jewish criminality, therefore, started to increase, and it's not surprising when you have a bad economy and a baby boom. That is when uh, crime takes off. Once again, you see this social engineering by the Austrian bureaucrats result in a disaster. An ancient civilization like the Ashkenazic Jews had evolved their own social order, which worked. So don't mess with what works. The Jews were a civilized group. They were not gypsies. You understand? They had stable family uh, situations and transfer of wealth in the normal way as a characteristic of most sophisticated societies. And therefore, the emperor violated the rule because he broke it, but you don't know it. You see? Finally, the emperor wanted to change the Jewish culture. He wanted to Germanize and Westernize the Jews. That way, things would be bureaucratically easier for him. And hopefully, maybe, maybe, it might get the Jews to convert. <laughs> you see? The Jewish masses at that time were overwhelmingly religious. They didn't want this. Too bad. So now starts a whole big parsha where they clash over this. But since the hour is late, let's pick this up next time. Good night. Okay.